Unbreakable 2005 made me mostly remembered for its crazy main event, but it also meant we were just weeks away from TNA debuting on Spike Flippin' TV. No, serious, it gave them proper television, it made fans go, oh my gosh, the wrestling war is back on. And it led to those weird debates where non-wrestling fans see you and they start pondering to themselves, why are they all so mad about the 18 to 49 demo? On that Spike TV show too, we got the debut of Team 3D or the Dudley Boys, so TNA were pulling out all the stops. And then over in WWE, they were going back to the USA Network and having a little show known as Raw Homecoming. That thing was three hours as well. And everyone was like, oh wow, three hours for a Raw. That will be really novel, and I'm sure they'd never do that all the time. And uh, look where we are in 2021. As for total non-stop action, and never forget that is what it was actually called, it was kind of stuck in between a rock and a hard place. Like, was it meant to be a WWE alternative, or was it just meant to be WWE light? And you could spin that either way, and many people did, but the jewel in the crown that we were all aware of was the damn X Division. I mean, it just shone like a light blinding your face with love, and even TNA officials knew that they had something here because what was the main event of Unbreakable 2005? Even though the world title's up for grabs, that's right, it was the three-way X Division match between Christopher Daniels, who was the champion, AJ Styles, and Samoa Joe. They also went out of their way to let you know it's not a cruiserweight division. And honestly, when Samoa Joe does walk down to the ring, Mike Tanay is just going crazy, going, Sue, this is why the X Division's great. Who's not a cruiserweight, but he's just the man? And trying to describe it is actually quite tough. I mean, I guess you just go for high risk, fast paced and really cool. And essentially what we had done here is we had looked at the indie scene, saw what a lot of fans were gravitating towards and gone, well, that seems like a cool new style. Maybe we should put it on our show. And that's kind of what the promotion came. You had good old fashioned wrestling and you had this new style and we infused them together. Although on the down low, I think we all would have been happier if TNA had just picked the new lane and driven down there. Seriously though, if you've never seen this triple threat, what the hell are you doing? I mean, it got five stars in the Wrestling Observer newsletter. And while it may not have the same impact, I'm such a funny guy. No, I'm not. And while it may not have the same impact, today when you view it through modern eyes, you could take this and drop it to any promotion in the world and nobody would blink an eye because it's what we're seeing every week. And it was likely responsible for a good lot of people getting into this style of wrestling and it just turned me on. No, it didn't. No, stop. It didn't turn... I just, I just enjoyed it. It also told the universe that AJ Styles, Samoa Joe and Christopher Daniels were top tier talent, which begs the question why back in 2005, nobody, including TNA, didn't really treat them as top tier talent. Like they were pushed, but you could have built your entire promotion around people like this. And we just never pulled the trigger properly. But there's a different video for a different time. So from Orlando, Florida, and of course the impact zone, let's take the finger of power and up those downs to TNA Unbreakable. 2005. Now, I don't want to be that guy, cue me about to be that guy, but you can kind of understand why TNA did become a company that got a lot of criticism thrown at it. Or more to the point that they were just hiring way too many guys from yesteryear. I mean, in the opening video alone, you see Rhino, Raven, and Jeff Jarrett. And then on the pay per view, you've got the likes of The Road Dog, Billy Gunn, and Jeff Hardy. And to be honest with you, I never massively minded this do whatever the hell you want but I understood the argument. The opening video is also terrible. I don't want to be that guy, but it is. It's meant to be a parody of Sunday Night Football, but it just doesn't work to the point when the voiceover guy went, there's going to be a load of sacks. I thought he said sex. Now he's talking about sacks when you take out the quarterback, but I was like, man, really? We're going to see some sex? I don't think I want to see that when I turn on my wrestling. Actually, that's not true. I didn't even blink. I just went, ho, 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 classic TNA sums it up. We then kick things off with a six-man tag team match that sees the Diamonds in the Rough, and that featured Simon Diamond, Elix Skipper, and David Young, taking on the three live crew that was the Road Dog, Jesse James, Conan, and R-Truth, then known as Wrong Killings. And yes, three live crew was spelt three, no space, live, and then crew was K-R-U because none of us could get away from 1999. And of course, the best thing about seeing anything from 16 years ago is looking at the wrestlers and going, man, you all look so young, apart from R-Truth or Ron Killings. He somehow looks younger now than he did back in 2005. We've talked about it on Retro Ups and Downs before, but I need his secret. Somebody, if you meet him at a future meet and greet, just ask him, what the hell are you doing? And pass those details on to me. Whatever it is, I will just 
Blood. Just get on with this. As Elix Skipper has been brought up too, we always have to mention Turning Point 2004. Just go to YouTube and type that in, Elix Skipper Turning Point 2004, and you will see the moment when he basically tight roped along a steel cage and then hit a Hurricane Rana from the top of it. It doesn't make any sense. I'd also would like somebody to tell me what the deal with Simon Diamond is, because as already mentioned, he was in a group called the Diamonds in the Rough, but I remember him in ECW in 1998. I mean, like, Simon, my namesake, come on, you're letting us down, brother. If you've been around seven years and you're still a diamond in the rough, well, damn it, you should be shining. Anyway, these guys all do beat on BG James for as long as it took my hair to fall out before he tags in Conan, who throws his shoe around, and you heard that right. And then he hit the X Factor onto Diamond, and he just won. I want to be horrible. I don't really think these six guys are into it. And I suppose it was just there to try and warm up the crowd, and they did seem kind of excited, even still down. We then found out what had happened earlier in the night, and we got to have our first glimpse of Monty Brown, who really does have to be considered one of wrestling's great mysteries. Because he seemed on the cusp of huge things before he decided to leave the business entirely to focus on his family. And well, you can't say fairer than that, Sounds like a very selfless man. He's also pouncing Raven out of his shoes here because he believes that he should be the world champion. And then out comes Jeff Jarrett to basically tell us, no, I should be world champion. And when I'm not on the screen, everybody should be thinking about me, Jeff Jarrett. If you know, you know. The WWE crew of Billy Gunn and Jeff Hardy then also join the party because everybody wants to hold the title. You will soon see how this ties in. Which then moved us into a TNA match, which instantly makes you go, oh, yep, this is what we should be focusing on. Because we have Austin Aries versus Roderick Strong. Yes, he who got screwed over on NXT TV recently. And they are having an X Division showcase belt. And look, I get that Aries is a controversial figure these days. So all I'm going to say is that I don't really understand anything he's saying. But in terms of this match, he's giving it up. At this juncture too, I realise that not only does Austin Aries here look like every single person that fronted a new metal band in the 90s, but also every person on this show has the same damn entrance music. It's just like, dun-dun-dun-dun, drum-drums, dun-dun-dun-dun. It's like I made it. So eventually somebody finally pushed stop on the demo track. And what's really excellent about this match is that TNA were doing it because it's what the fans wanted. Like Austin Aries and Roderick Strong were making their names in Ring of Honor. But these weren't top tier talent. They were starting from the bottom. But people have said, hey, we'd love to see you fight. So that's what we got. And also in ROH, they were stable mates. But here they were fighting. TNA even mentions that. And it just makes you feel like you're part of a bigger wrestling world. The six-sided ring also soon reared its head because a couple of times Austin Aries goes to run into the ropes and then kind of hits a ring post instead, twirls around, looks up, looks down, goes, oh, I better hit the ropes, and there he does. And it's not his fault. Like Roderick Strong has a few moments like this too, but I'm not going to lie, it makes me laugh every time. Strong overpowered him in the early going, and I'm 99% sure this was legit because some of the chops that were coming from Roddy, he must have hated Spineshank. Then later on, Austin Aries just gives him a brain buster and drops him right on his head. They were trying to be impressive. I think it may have legitimately not Roderick Strong loopy too, because he's trying to get into position for the 450, but he's just kind of flailing around the place. And that is a little bit of an issue, because he's in the middle of the ring, and because it is a six-sided one, when Austin climbs to the top rope, he is one hell of a far away. Even then though, Austin hits it as if it's effortless, and that was pretty damn good to watch. I mean, I was kind of scared we were going to get a Brock Lesnar situation, and thank goodness we did not. Really fun stuff all around, though, and a must if you want to see Roderick Strong before he could do absolutely anything within the squared circle. Although, to be fair, even here you can look at him and go, man, he's going to shine. A quick backstage bit followed with Monty Brown and Billy Gunn, and they both hate each other, even though in a couple of seconds they're going to have to be a team. And more interestingly than this is that they're taking on Apollo and Lance Hoyt, just want to talk about Lance Hoyt for a few seconds. Because of course Lance Hoyt today is Lance Archer and I'm 99% sure if I had sat there without this information in my brain, I wouldn't have even realised. Like he kind of looks similar but he is so more intimidating in 2021. This is kind of like his more timid cousin. I mean maybe he learned how to be an absolute beast after we started chucking people through the ceiling and they are accompanied to the ring by Sonny Sazaki. Now look, I have no recollection of Sonny Sazaki but you can just lay eyes on him and instantly you say, well, that guy clearly wants to be The Rock. And it looked like the great one had just thrown up over him. And really, this is more of a showcase match than anything else, aside from Billy Gunn, who had the experience, because it was just a bunch of new dudes trying to find their way. And I've got no problem with that. 
but it does mean it's not as smooth as you may be expecting. There are a lot of hoit hoit chants though, so they're well into him, especially when he's smashing out moon souls despite being like 6667. But then you soon realize this whole process was designed to carry on the feud between Billy Gunn and his friend, but not friend, Monty Brown. Because towards the end, Billy just boots Monty right in the head and then goes, well, that was your fault. And I'm like, Billy, it wasn't at all. And of course, in any other match, you'd go, well, this means that they're going to lose and the other guy's going to win. But no! Instead, Apollo super kicks Billy Gunn, but he only gets a near fall for two. And then Monty Brown gets back in there. He hits the pounce and Monty Brown and Billy Gunn win. And I audibly went, why? The only answer I could come up with is that maybe, just maybe, Someone didn't want to lose to the new guys. Down. I am just going to give it up for Team Canada, though. Those guys were great. Up. I mean, Bobby Roode, Eric Young, A1, and Pete Williams even look good together. Although Bobby is a little bit pissed off here because they haven't been very Canadian-y lately. So it's time to stick it to America and salute the Maple Leaf. I mean, it's such a stupid gimmick. It's such a stupid gimmick. We're from Canada, and you're not from Canada, and therefore we hate you. Love it. TNA then went TNA. I mean, it was meant to be Petey Williams versus Chris Saban, and it was to a point, because all of a sudden, out of the speakers starts Abyss's music, so dun, 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 and out walks Petey Williams. And I was so confused, and after a quick bit of research, it turned out that TNA had pushed the stupid wrong button. I mean, this would be the equivalent of, well, I don't know, Crash Holly is about to make his entrance, and instead it goes bong, and the Undertaker's music start, and then out walks Crash Holly. It was so, so stupid, even though I did laugh. Down. As for that match, though, it was fantastic. Up. Now, any time we mention Pete Williams, we do have to give him the credit of being the dude who basically made the Canadian Destroyer as popular as it was. So on one hand, yes, we credit him, but on the other, we yell at him, look what you did, you stupid fool, now it's as common as a wrist lock. The story here as well is that both Williams and Saban have been trained by none other than Scott Damore, who of course these days is essentially running Impact Wrestling. If that doesn't prove that this profession isn't massively incestuous, well, I don't know what does. And really, we come back to talking about this new star becoming its own again, because both guys here are 23 years old. They just run through the whole thing at 100 miles per hour, and they're so athletic and they're so agile, you can't help but watch it and go, man, isn't this a barrel of fun? I mean, within the opening five minutes, I don't think they stopped. You see drop kicks, and you see arm drags, and you see hurricane runners, and you see Chris Saban's face getting chucked into the barricade. They give you everything you need. I also think that Chris Saban has to be considered one of the most underrated guys ever. Why has he never been in a proper huge super duper promotion? And he proves that here when he hits this springboard DDT. And I know in 2021, who cares? But in 2025, plug me in. They also do a buckle bomb, which falls into this category. I mean, the commentators and the fans can't believe what they've just seen. And then we go old school because Pete Williams rakes the eyes of Chris Saban. And he's so blind, he picks up the referee and almost beats him up. Thankfully, he didn't. That referee would have been down for the next 742 years. It also did lead to a pretty good finish because Williams goes for the Canadian Destroyer, which is so over the audience goes crazy, but Chris Saban is able to reverse it into the cradle shock and almost steal the pin. But again, people were so desperate to see that flipping pile driver, they actually boo Chris Saban. Have you seen Chris Saban's face you don't boo that. You take it home to your mother and go, look who I found. She's like, oh my gosh, he's wonderful. It also made me laugh because again, we were booing the Canadian Destroyer here because we didn't see it. I just wanted to kind of beam myself in and go, guys, don't worry. In about 20 years time, you're going to see this run every single corner. Hell, if you come to your grandma's house, she'll probably be busting out Canadian Destroyers because everybody does it. Matt Bentley turned up afterwards and beat the hell out of both of them. I just have to be that guy. I don't remember Matt Bentley. So I was like, all right, Matt, you go, girl. And then Pete Williams was back out. And I was like, oh, no, wait, it's finally time for Abyss. Terrifyingly, too, he was taking on Sabu. And that rhymed, so now I'm happy. But if you know anything about either of these guys, I mean, Sabu's nickname was I'm homicidal and I'm a maniac. And Abyss just loved throwing himself into glass. James Mitchell, who was Abyss's manager at the time, also just goes, hey, ho, why don't we make it a no DQ match? And then, well, you can already imagine what happened here. Absolute carnage. I mean, I say that, but at first it was actually reasonably calm. They were kind of having a wrestling match. And even when Abyss went to get some tables, Sabu just tucked himself into the big man. And I was like, okay, I can handle that. 
but I think it pissed Abyss off. Because he went and grabbed Sabu and belly to bellied him over the top rope through a table. And I was just asking myself, how did Sabu do this for so long? Especially because he then gets a chair and he hits Abyss so hard in the head, I thought about ringing my mother and apologizing. And what does that even mean? But that's the emotion I felt. He then hits him with the Arabian Skull Crusher through a table. And I was like, Sabu, what are you doing? He just lands right on his neck. And I honestly was surprised he wasn't dead. Somehow he was still alive though, and Abyss wasn't keen on that. So he went and got the thumbtacks. Thumbtacks. In what walk of life would anybody go, I know what this situation needs, sharp objects that I can stick in someone's ass. And do you know what then happened? Sabu went for a moonsault, Abyss caught him, and Black Hole slammed him into the thumbtacks. And I just like, man, damn you, Mick Foley, you have so much to answer for. But that was the end of it too, and it just wouldn't be right to do anything but give this an up. They worked too hard, and they took too many risks, and they put too many of their bodies on the line. And I bet these two would just do it again if they were booked today as well. I mean, later on in the year, they were having one of those barbed wire massacre matches. So yeah, let's just forget about it and move on and be nice and give it up. Sean Waltman then no-showed Unbreakable. Uh -oh. Now, if you know Sean's story, you know that he was struggling with quite a few things back then, although today he's an absolute delight and you should listen to his podcast. But yes, he was meant to be teaming up with Alex Shelley, who was backstage here going, well, I don't know where he is, so I guess I'll just go fight alone. We did have a kayfabe reason for all of this, though. As Mike Tanay and Don West told us, Sean Waltman is crazy. That's what they said. 2001 WWE then somehow reared its head in 2005 because our next match was actually Bobby Roode versus Jeff Hardy. I mean, I'm pretty sure we've actually seen that in the last year or two. And somehow 2005 TNA managed to out shenanigan modern day WWE. Down. And this is just wild. I mean, for starters, much like Sean Waltman, Jeff Hardy was going through a few things in his personal life and that was affecting his performance. And maybe TNA didn't want either of them to lose properly, so we just got the Gaga gun and we started to shoot it like Rambo with his flipping machine rifle. Because it was fine when Pete Williams was back out, because like, okay, Team Canada, I get it, I understand the relationship there. But then Jeff Jarrett just waltzed out, he got a hockey stick, he hit Jeff Hardy about 32 times, and that may not sound so bad, but you just wait until we talk about it in five minutes. And he then just rolled Hardy back in the ring, allowing Rude to pin him. And again, this ties into what I need to talk about in a second. But honestly, the most overbooked craziness. However, before we get to that point, the tag team titles were on the line next. It was fine. Uh, because it was America's Most Wanted versus Team Canada versus The Naturals versus Alex Shelley and nobody because Sean Waltman hadn't turned up. And once again, Mike Tanay and Don West just like, ah, Sean sure what, what a moron. What an idiot. Who would no show a wrestling show if we ever see him again? We're going to punch him in the face. Soon after this, Sean Waltman just returned. What was much nicer was that a lot of this was framed around Chris Candido, who had passed away recently in a very, very sad story. And that's how Alex Shelley actually got some help after he had his ass beaten for around about five minutes. Because Johnny Candido just realizes at one point, oh, I can be your partner, and he runs into the ring, which means the rules here were actually that anybody in the crowd could have done this, and it would have been fine. And actually, I bet afterwards, Shelley was like, why did you do this, you absolute buffoon? Because Johnny loses him the match. I mean, he just gets punched in the balls by Eric Young, and that's it. One, two, three, he gets pinned. Alex Shelley genuinely would have been better if he had just gone it alone. Team Canada then cheats again when A1 hits Chris Harris with a hockey stick. And I was like, if that was your plan, why did you do it in the previous match? And it ends with Young getting some testicle revenge when he is crotched on the top rope by none other than Jimmy Hart. And you now may be like, wait a minute, wasn't Jimmy Hart under a Legends contract in 2005? He was. For some reason, this was fine to do. And fair play to Eric Young too, who sells this like his penis has just fallen off. And soon afterwards, the Naturals hit the natural disaster. They get the one, two, three. And yeah, this was basically all the tag teams within TNA having a fight. It was okay. It was at this stage that we found out that the world title was going to semi-main event the thing and that TNA should have done this more and more given the popularity of the X Division title. And we found another way to take the rules and throw them out the window when we were told it's going to be a Ravens rules match. Which essentially just means you can do whatever you want. But if they're Ravens rules, why didn't Ravens say to Rhino, who is challenging for his world championship, well, the rule is no matter what you do, I win. But alas, that didn't happen. And I swear that these two, along with Abyss and Sabu, must have just sat down earlier and said, well, you tell us what nuts things you're going to do. And then we'll come up with some more nuts things 
but we don't want to do the same nuts things, it's got to be exclusive nutsness. Because we have kendo sticks, chairs, yet more dick shots, when Raven goes and gets a pizza cutter and starts pizza cuttering up Rhino's face. I don't know about you, but if I got invited around to dinner at Raven's house and he said, oh, we're having some of Rhino's nose, I would be like, I don't want to eat it. The crowd then starts, we want pizza, but instead we get cookie trays and trash cans and blood. A hell of a lot of blood. You think that would be enough, but no. Raven then has to go and get a staple gun like he's a secretary for a big firm. They're then both then just flying into chairs like they want to break their skulls. And eventually Cassidy Riley or Riley Cassidy comes out. He was friends with Raven, but he's such a moron. He distracts the referee and Raven can't pin Rhino after the DDT because of this schmo. And yes, it is at this stage when TNA takes everything they've already done in the show and just copy and paste it which led me again to go, well, why did you do it in the first place? And of course, it starts with somebody being punched in the balls. This time, that was done by Rhino, leading you to believe that he is going to win. But then out comes Jeff Jarrett, and this time he gets the world title, and he's going to hit someone. And then Jeff Hardy is out here, and he stops Jeff Jarrett, because obviously earlier, Jeff Jarrett screws him over, and then Raven basically just hits everybody with a DDT, and he wins. I mean, this much stuff never needs to happen in a world title match. And if the powers that be deem that it does need to happen, well, I'm going to guess that something went wrong along the way. And that's not to say it's not fun to a certain extent, because it is, because it is proper car crash stuff. And once again, based on effort alone, I'm going to give it an up. But honestly, there is so much nonsense here. You can forget about everything else that does happen on this card, though, because by the time we get to our main event, which is AJ Styles and Samoa Joe going after Christopher Daniels' X Division title... Well, it is just one of the most beautiful things you will ever see. Honestly, I know I've said it once, but I'll say it twice. How did people in the company not look at these three guys and just go, well, yep, we found the future right here. It's just so obvious. It's like this. Do you ignore that? No, you do something about it. Joe and Stars team up to begin with because they're like, well, if we can take out the champion, maybe we'll have a better shout. And as soon as they have done that, AJ Styles is just busting out all these surprise roll-ups and Samoa Joe doesn't like that. So he starts hitting all the submissions. Every damn thing is just so believable. Daniels then gets back into the thing. He's just kicking everybody in the face while also selling he's a bit loopy. I mean, it is just non-stop. <laughs> I hate myself. I don't really know what else to do here because there's so much that deserves a mention. I mean, Christopher Daniels' split-legged moonsault to the outside. AJ Styles' springboard 450 also to the outside. Both of them get so much height on these, I am 99% sure when all was said and done, they became registered planets. I think it's just the enthusiasm that all three guys have. You can tell that they want to be the best. It's like if you have kids and they go play sports. You don't really care if they win, you don't really care if they lose, you just want them to show something, and this trio shows you everything. I mean, if they had been told, right, you've got to go out there and take your pants off and do a naked dance, they still would have found a way to make it work. The crowd is also going bonkers, as would I, and by the time Daniels monkey flips AJ Styles into Samoa Joe, and then AJ Styles reverses that into a Harakarana, I push pause, and I went and had a bath. I don't know why, I just needed some relaxed time. Samoa Joe is also the most realistic wrestler ever, and you can just buy into everything that he does, and while I would have preferred it if Christopher Daniels hadn't gone and got the world title at one point, or the X Division title, because we'd seen it so much, it doesn't really tie into anything. So I was like, you know what? I can handle that. Thankfully, that is as much gaga as we get. And yes, look, just go and watch it. It's brilliant. It deserves five stars. I'm just going to mention here randomly, of course, it's getting a golden up. How the hell could it not be? And it also has some insider stuff here. Like Samoa Joe has Christopher Daniels in a front face lock. And you can hear him calling the next spot. Because I'm a massive nerd always enjoy hearing that. The finish is perfectly executed too and the whole thing has been so fast and so well paced you need it like a, oh my gosh where did that come from? So when Christopher Daniels goes to the angel's wings AJ Styles reverses it into like a modified backslide thingamajig and he gets the one two three everybody loses their minds we got a brand new X Division champion and what's more what I should be saying was and then in a couple of years AJ Styles was the biggest wrestler in the world. But we didn't do it. Somebody explain this to me. There was also more depth here too because it meant that Samoa Joe was still undefeated, at least from a pinfall and submission point of view. And while I know TNA had plenty of other highlights along the way, if this isn't in the top five, then my name isn't Simon Jeremy Miller. That's right, my middle name is Jeremy. All of this show, and just for the main event mostly, is getting a damn up. And I've already given you one, but I will finish off with the Wrestling Observer ratings. So I don't know how much you enjoy them. Our opening six-man tag... Oh, what's 
star. Austin Aries versus Roderick Strong got three and a half stars. Kip James and Monty Brown taking on Apollo and Lance Hoyt got one and a quarter star. Chris Saban versus Petey William got three stars. I maybe add on an extra half a star to that. Abyss versus Sabu in the crazy match got two and three quarter stars. Bobby Roode versus Jeff Hardy got two stars. There is way too many matches on this show. The Fatal 4-Way Elimination Tag Team match got three stars. Raven versus Rhino just has nothing next to it. So I will just give it a lovely two and a half to three stars. And of course, our main event got five stars and Dave Meltzer is 100% correct. Now, as always, don't forget to leave your choice of retro show in the comments below and the four that get upvoted the most go into the poll next week. Sometimes people tweet me and they go, Simon, I want this show. I'd love to give it to you, but that's just not how the rules work. What do you think this is? TNA. I'm such an idiot. It is untrue. Then like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Again, why not go and watch old retro ups and downs? There's loads of them. You can also go to whatculture.com and read yourself some wrestling articles. And of course, you can go follow us on social media. But don't tweet me about voting. I just explained it. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you very much for watching me as always. And I'll see you on the next one.